The majestic River Severn has long held huge significance to both humans and wildlife. Sweeping through the country for 220 miles, it is the UK's longest river and boasts the highest tidal range in all of Europe. Hosting a huge number of migratory species from as far as the Sahara and the Sargasso Sea, the Severn is an ecosystem of global wildlife significance and that's indicated by its many conservation designations. The estuarine mudflats offer feeding grounds for huge numbers of waders and wild birds. The upper reaches are equally important for endangered migratory fish species such as the European eel. The area's rich cultural and industrial history has shaped the very course of the river. In the 1800s, navigation weirs and locks were built to improve passage for large commercial vessels, developing trading links to the outside world. But for thousands of years before this, the River Severn was a highway for migrating wildlife and home to almost every species of British freshwater fish. The Severn and its tributaries are also the keeper of a fascinating secret. Amongst the 110 different fish species supported by the Severn is a long forgotten fish, the Twait Shad. The Shad was once prolific in the Severn, returning from sea each spring in huge numbers to spawn in the upper reaches, bringing with them a pulse of nutrients. But through the 1800s, weirs and locks being constructed with the industrialization of the river created an impenetrable barrier for the fish as they moved upstream to their spawning grounds. And numbers were devastated. Nowadays, only small populations exist in little pockets, both in the team and in the Severn. Today, I'm on the banks of the Severn near Tewkesbury, where I'm learning about an ambitious project called Unlocking the Severn. The project aims to harness the potential of the Severn, both in natural and economic terms, enhancing the Severn and its reaches for future generations of local people, for communities, and of course, for wildlife. I'm here to meet Charles Crundwell, a scientist on the project, to hear about the groundbreaking work that's being carried out. So Charles, can you tell me a little bit about the Unlocking the Seven project? The Unlocking the Seven project is a four-year project which is going to try and re-establish the iconic Twait Shad up the River Severn um, by removing the barriers to them so they can actually swim upstream and get back to their historic spawning grounds. But it's also about unlocking the history of this fish to the River Severn and the communities that are, uh, around it. People don't really know about the river anymore and about the fish on it. The, the shad is, is a significant species, isn't it, locally and historically? It's very well documented how shad disappeared from this river and you can literally date it to the year. The navigation weirs were built and that literally in two years stopped the shad going any further than Worcester. And that is locked, it's still locked there pretty much undisturbed to how it was when those weirs went up and this project will allow those shad over the coming years to go all the way back up and produce uh, more offspring which ultimately will contribute to the favourable status of the special area of conservation of the Severn Estuary. So everything will go back into balance. So in terms of gathering the information about the shad and the movements of the shad, how are you doing that? Shad are poorly studied. So what we've done here is we've taken a, a new technique of uh, acoustic tagging, actually putting a tag inside the fish. Now that's in itself is not new, but doing it on the Twait Shad is. So we made kind of an elaborate trap which basically allowed the fish to swim up the weir face and then it's literally a case of you see one, you drop the door, it's trapped. And so what they do is they catch the fish, they anaesthetize it very, very gently. It's um, measured and all the weights and a little bit of genetics taken off it. And then a tiny, tiny incision is made in it with a tiny tag is just literally put in and one stitch suture to stitch it back up. Now, until we started tagging, we had no idea where they actually went. But this tagging has shown that within a month of leaving the river, one, actually made it all the way across to Ireland and that fish has made it all the way back just a few months later and is already back on the River Severn this year. It's a wonderful thing that isn't it that uh, what you're doing is marrying uh, sort of biology and history and culture and this very very important local story. It's very rare to have a project which brings that all together. Once people have forgotten about it then that becomes the new norm. So most people don't think this river has this fish species anymore yeah. and we want to change that. We want people to go, 
The seven. Oh, the shad. You know, they want people to use it in the, in the same sentence. And I think that will be achieved. Alongside the tagging programme, there are a number of citizen science and volunteer projects that have been running for a while now. Tim is the very first volunteer coordinator on the project, helping to make this happen. So Tim, looking behind you there, you've got this very glamorous scene, you know, in the rain, with folks standing in the river there. And, but you're getting an army of volunteers, local people coming down to get into, and you coordinate those volunteers. So I recruit volunteers to come and visit the site throughout the uh, migration season and they help us estimate the, uh, the population as it migrates upstream. So they're, they're, they're local people, some of whom use the site already. Um, not many of them had any um, background or interest in fish before that, but we've got them really enthusiastic about the shad. And yeah, they're just people who found out about the project, um, are interested in what we're doing here, um, and just wanted the opportunity to see the fish and, and sort of help out. And what sort of work will they be doing as volunteers? So it's quite simple at this site. They collect some environmental data. Today they'd probably make a note of the rain, and then they literally count fish coming through as they move past the white boards there and that, that helps us um, estimate the population. It's a lovely thing that, isn't it? Because I think you get a local community buy-in and suddenly everyone's talking to everyone else about it and yeah. it makes this species loom large again in, in local culture. Yeah, absolutely and it's yeah. fantastic and I'm, I've been really inspired to see how many people have wanted to be involved as well. Alongside the scientific research, there's going to be extensive construction work carried out over the next few years. Through the construction of fish passes on the River Severn and modification of two smaller weirs on the team, the hope is that the historic migration route of the Shad will be reinstated, boosting population numbers and helping to restore the river for both wildlife and for people. I'm heading to Diglis Weir, where one of the largest fish passes will be built over the coming year to meet Jason Leach, who will be overseeing the works as they take place. So here we are at Diglis. So just over the other side of the weir is where we're going to be putting the first fish pass. Now, to explain what the fish pass is, what does that mean? So we kind of see them as a ladder to allow the fish to get from the lower area up to the top of the weir. At the moment, they can't make it up that slope. So what we're doing is putting steps in to make it easier for them to get over. So whatever the flow, whatever the weather, they'll be able to make it over. And the whole idea is to unlock the upper reaches of the river, which essentially have been off limits to the Shad for almost 200 years now. That's right, and they're really courageous. They, they, every year they come here, a very small population, but can't get anywhere else. So what we're doing is unlocking the Severn to allow them to get to their historic spawning grounds and hopefully recover their population to what it used to be before these things were built. So that's one phase, but what, what are the phases to the engine? Because there's an awful lot of engineering going on around. Well, this is just one of the four sites we're doing. So we're going to be working at two sites in parallel up at Beverley, about five or six miles upstream. And then next year, we've got two more at Holt and Lincoln. And that really then cements the civil engineering works. And I think over the years, people have become disconnected from the river, actually using the shad. And then what an amazing story it is about getting them back in here to re-engage them. At this site, we're having uh, effectively a big underwater aquarium where every May and June we'll open it to the public and hopefully people will flock to see this rare fish. Yeah. And now more than ever, it's important for the, the recovery of the species and for, for us as a species coming out and enjoying it. Over the coming months and years, the organisations and the volunteers involved in the Unlocking the Seven project are going to be working tirelessly to achieve its goals. This critical work depends wholly on the time and effort of the people involved. And it provides such an important boost for a really important ecosystem. And I can't wait to come back in a year's time to see how they've got on. As construction got underway, a number of challenges were thrown at the project. Record-breaking rainfall caused months of flooding on the river, stalling construction. But despite this, and then a global pandemic, they forged on, and just 12 months later than planned, I'm heading back to see the results. It's been two years since I've been here, since I've walked along this towpath, so I can't wait to see what progress has been made. So this is it. Wow. This is the first wow. of the fish passes we've built at Diglis. You can see it's this monumental feat of civil engineering. I had visions of this 
sort of tiny little concrete stepladder, essentially. And I'm looking at this Brunellian massive engineering project. This is a substantial bit of work, isn't it? It is really massive. I mean, this is the biggest of the four we've built. It's, it's the biggest deep vertical slot in England and Wales. 100 metres long, 8 metres wide, 8 metres deep. And it's taken us 18 months to build. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty epic challenge. Yeah, I think it exceeds people's expectations yes. without, without sad, yeah. shadow of a doubt. Well, this is only one of four we're constructing. We've got another three upstream. We've also delivered two partial weir removals on the River Team, uh, and we've had over 6,000 volunteer hours. So it's a huge effort by wow. our supporters. And we've had about 2,500 children engaged. There is something really exciting I really want to show you, though. OK. Downstairs into the gallery. I'm Should in your go? capable hands. Feels like a James Bond lair. <laughs> Villain lair, yes, yes exactly. <laughs> Look at that. Worth the wait. Two years in the making. Yes, and this is the end result. It's, it's funny, it's, um, it's a lens into the river, isn't it? To a degree, this is almost the end point, isn't it? This is, uh, it's a scientific tool, but also it's an engagement tool with the public and they can actually see what's passing through the, the fish ladder place. Absolutely, every single fish at the moment has to come past this window, so we get to film it and we get to watch them. That moment of wonder for visitors, for young people, children, I think it's, it's going to be an amazing thing to, to reach. It's the only one in England and Wales that you can view a, a river, you can wow. see wild fish and have an appreciation of the environment. Yeah. So were you clustered around the window after it was built? It was a very tense couple of days. When we get the water in, we've done a bit of testing, and then there it was, a little dace, I think was the first one to come through. And then hours and days later, we had a, an array of fish through. But it was amazing, it exceeded expectations. This has been a real community effort and a team effort. And, um, and, and in terms of the volunteers who've been involved, they must feel like massive pride. Huge. We're inviting them in here to have a look at their hard work and see, yeah. see some fish. It's been, been amazing and a great little thank you for their, all their support. Yeah. The, the, the pivotal moment is a shad going through, isn't it? Can you remember that moment? And the 9th of May is the first one we saw on a recording. It was an amazing moment. Charles, our scientist, got a call from the PhD student. I've had a ping from one of the shads in the fish pass. Quarter past one on the 9th of May. <laughs> So Charles got straight onto the computer, looked at that time frame, and there it was, a shad go through. And, and we're going to be doing this for years to come to monitor that hopeful steady increase in the population over the next five, ten years. And, and we're there for, for a long time. And now we can sit back and watch, we can engage, we can have a look, and hopefully you know, see these fish return year and year after year. Yeah. Over the coming years, we're hoping to see population numbers of the shad continue to increase, and that can only have a positive impact on the River Severn ecosystem as a whole. As the final fish pass is completed, the project will have unlocked 158 miles of habitat, offering easy passage upriver, and not just for the shad, but all fish on the river, including other endangered species, such as salmon, eel, and lamprey. This project demonstrates how we can harness new scientific insights and modern engineering to help us live in better balance with nature. And that represents a really exciting model for the future.
Good evening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed what you just watched, watching that lovely film, Exploring Unlocking the Severn. My name is Sam Langford. I am the digital producer for the Festival of Nature 2022. Um, you can see people liking what we've just we've just seen. People are watching. Hello, wherever you are. Um, that was just a really lovely way to start tonight's event. We've talked about Unlocking the Severn as a project. We've watched that lovely film to see what was a monumental effort that has been going on um, to reintroduce the Shad into parts of the, the Severn. Now, we're going to speak to some of the team um, that have been part of bringing this project together and part of that film as well. So please welcome Jenny and Lorna. Hello, folks. How are Hi. you doing? Hi, everybody. Good evening. So I'm going to start very quickly, just very briefly. Who are you both and what do you do? I'm going to come to you first, Jenny. Hi, so I'm Jenny Hermely and I'm the communications and marketing manager on the Unlocking the Seven project. And so I was involved in making this film, um, which we started back in 2018, would you believe? Um, and lots of other things to help people engage with the project, understand the shad, learn about the fish on the river um, and understand all this fish, fish passes, these huge fish passes that we've been building. Fab, welcome. And Lorna, I'll come to you. Uh, so my name's Lorna Peterson and I'm the Community Engagement Manager for Unlocking the Seven. I'm a, I'm a relative newcomer to the project compared to Jenny. Um, so I've been with them since November last year. Um, and my kind of primary focus has been delivering our activity programme of community engagement alongside the project. So following all of the engineering works being completed and all the fish passes being open. Um, so we've just had a work, it's still in the midst of a really exciting programme of events. Um, and we've just had our first shad run on the river since all the fish passes was completed. So um, yeah, it's been a really exciting time. Fab, well that actually gives like a really good way for us to explore this. We've got Jenny, you're coming at it from the 2018 angle, um, back from the beginning, and Lorna from the, that more recent angle. Um, First of all, what a what a film that you put together to explore that project. Like, could what was the process like putting together a film that started in twenty eighteen? When did it when did it finish? Was it like very recently or? That's a great question. Um, it's been a long time in the making, and and it has gone a lot longer than it was planned to. So we work with Nina Constable, who's this great wildlife filmmaker, and you may have seen some of her other work. She's done some films on uh, beaver releases, for instance. If, if, got lots of traction um but uh so we started filming at the very start of the project and then the project was due to have completed um last year in fact uh but we've because of covid and also some really severe flooding issues that we've had on the river um we've um, been very lucky and our funders have extended the project so it's gone on uh, yeah more than a year more, longer with the filming um so, yeah. Well, it's it's brought together what is a really, really lovely final product. So um it might have been a bit longer than you maybe hoped, but it seems as though it's been absolutely worth it. It's a huge infrastructure project. Um it was really interesting to watch through that to see when it got to the passes being built. They were they were much bigger than I thought they were gonna be. Um that They're must have been huge. the same for a lot of people seeing them, yeah. Yeah, and I think what's really interesting is um, we I was very lucky I got the chance to go down while they were still constructing them. And you've kind of lost all sense of scale now. As soon as the water goes through and you can't physically see a little person standing down in the bottom, hmm. even you know, even the sense of the scale is, is, is hard to capture. They're a massive structure. So the one in Diglis in Worcester with the window, that's over 100 metres long. It's a really big structure wow. and for a long time we spent we were talking about these things and trying to explain them before they were built so it's fabulous that they are there now and working with fish going through them um because that's what it's all about for us so when it comes to getting people to 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 see this infrastructure that's being put in lorna you talked about kind of community engagement around it and there was a figure put in there of like several thousand school children that have been engaged as part of it as well um, what what sorts of things are school children like doing when they go to visit the project? 
So we've got a couple of really incredible assets at Diglis in particular in Worcester. So along with the Fish Pass and the Viewing Gallery, there's also the Heritage Lock Island. Um, so when the weirs were built, which you heard Monty talk about in the documentary, um, in the 1840s, we had all these islands created in the River Severn, which I, until I worked on a project, I had no idea that they were there. So the whole thing was called the Severn Navigation and the um, the weirs were built to maintain water levels upstream to, so that boats could move up and down the river all year. And then to make space for the locks, for the boats to pass through, they created these lock islands. Um, and the one at Diglis is particularly interesting and special um, because we have um, a workshop there um, which was built in the Victorian times where the lock gates were built and that's been refurbished as part of the project as well. So both for our public tours and our school visits um, they kind of centre on the workshop on the island. It's sort of our, our visitor centre um, and we have some great activities that we run with the school kids in there um, and then they get to go around and see the fish pass as well so um, we're really lucky to have such an amazing heritage asset as well as this kind of brand spanking new cutting edge piece of engineering as well it's quite an, uh, a heady mix <laughs> it seems like a really interesting way to kind of combine that local cultural heritage of the way the area was used in the past and then combine it with this what i guess might might look like a kind of futuristic infrastructure that's next to it like to to show the way that the the use of the lands progressed over time um is really really impressive um i i was speaking to jenny and laura before this that was the first time i've seen that film so i'm just blown away by what's been what's been achieved already through this process there was something that was mentioned um during the construction phase monty mentioned that, that there was flooding that had impacted some of the construction um do you do, does the project feel and any of the kind of researchers that are involved feel that there's going to be further impacts because of things like climate change um, and storms like that have an impact on what we see those passes achieving i think for me um then we are seeing a lot more flooding events on the river so you know what was a one one in 100 year event is happening a lot more regularly. So, you know, we're seeing climate impacts and impacts of, of land use further up the catchment. Um, what that means for the fishes is really important that we kind of get this vital part of their life cycle right, because the challenges that, that these species are facing, both in their part of their life cycle as out at sea, and when they migrate onto the river to spawn, they're only going to increase. So it's really kind of critical that we protect this part of their life cycle, the spawning that takes place in the rivers. In terms of the actual fish passes themselves, that they are designed to operate in a really wide range of flow conditions because the levels of the water in, of the depth of the river in the River Seven have always gone up and down a lot. That's kind of why they put the weirs in. Um, so the kind of passes we've built operate in a wide range of conditions. And actually, when there's flooding, they just get overtopped. So in many ways, it doesn't really matter when it floods because the fish can swim right over the weir. That being said, it's not ideal for spawning because no sensible fish is going to spawn in the middle of a flood. Um, and, and we actually have from tagging these fish, we've seen that when there is a flood event like there was, we had uh, high river levels last year for the spawning season. They just headed back out to sea out to the estuary um, and then as soon as the river levels dropped again they came back in again and had a sort of late shorter condensed spawning run okay yeah also that's really uh, of, uh, sorry sam no no, say, no 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 on you go on the impacts of climate change am i right jenny that the this is kind of the northernmost part of the Toitshad range at the moment. And so we, we think, we don't know, but potentially we could see an increase in population due to warming waters further south. So in that sense for the fish, we hope that the passes have future-proofed the River Severn to an extent. Yeah, so they may, yeah, they may, we're at the northernmost reach, so they may be facing more challenges at, you know, at the bottom end of their, of their range. Um, okay. But what's, so We've just had a big shad symposium that the project's hosted with experts on Twait shad from all over Europe. And what was amazing to hear was just how different their life strategies and some of their behaviours were in different locations. And I think that even surprised us all because we took the behaviour of our shad on the River Severn 
as you know that's what a shad does but actually they're doing different things in different locations with different rivers and climates so that was quite interesting and I guess that could mean different interventions that might be required of those different behaviours and patterns of what they're actually doing in those yeah. different localities. Wildlife is so unpredictable. Like whenever you, whenever you hear about any species that is existing in various different corners of the world, you can say that it does this thing here, this thing there. Um, I always get so fascinated hearing the different ways that they they um, behave depending on where you are. Um, Two th two other things I really want to talk about is that obviously this project is, there was a lot of a lot of discussion on on the shad, but also Monty touched on some of the other species that have been positively impacted, and so we've got salmon and eels and lamprey. Um, I think it was the three they specifically mentioned. Um, what sorts of impacts has the project seen for those species? Has there been positive um, kind of uptick in those populations? Well. I think we're going to have to wait a little while to see the kind of um, the positive effect on population size filtering through. But what we are able to see is actually the species using the pass, the one that has the monitoring window where we're filming it 24 seven. So if anyone's really interested and want to see all kinds of freshwater fish on our rivers, we've got some great playlists on YouTube on the Unlocking the Seven a YouTube site and you can literally see all kinds of fish using the pass. Um, so Monty in the in the film he mentioned sea, sea lamprey and um, Atlantic salmon and eel because they're other migratory species so they have this need to make big journeys on the river to spawn. Well eels are actually doing it in the other direction but sea lamprey and Atlantic salmon are coming from the sea into the river to spawn. Um, so those are why they were particularly highlighted and they're also you know species that are threatened as well. Um, so recently we had this fantastic week um, where it seemed that all the sea lamprey were running and we actually were able to witness it where, um, and we've looked at the footage and so far we've counted over 800 sea lamprey coming through uh, the Worcester Fish Pass on their on their way upstream to spawn and you know some of these sea lamprey are massive you know over a meter long um, and they're in, they're in itself like a fascinating species. So we can witness it, we can witness their movements and, and over time, yes, we want to see, uh, they get to better quality spawning habitat and then the population over time is, is restored. That's what we want to see. Fantastic. Um, so for those who are, who are watching, don't know, I'm in Glasgow. I'm quite far away from where this is going on. And I'm really, really jealous that I'm not closer by to it. So if I'm down in the area, I will definitely be making a trip to go and have a look at the screen um, if that was possible. But I'm also going to go and check out the YouTube link, which is scrolling along the bottom um, for people to go and check out. There was also mention of um, huge numbers of volunteer hours that have been put into this project, which is just absolutely incredible to see that amount of and dedication to the citizen science to make this project um, come to life. So what, what sort of response has there been in the community to this project? It seems positive, but I'd love to hear more about it. It has been really positive. Um, I think because it, it, it the, the engineering and the construction went on so long, um, it, the particularly local people really got invested in, in the project um, and you know got used to seeing it, particularly Diglis is on a really popular walking route around Worcester um, by the River Severn. And, uh, and we're still getting people now who are coming and visiting and saying, oh, you know, we've walked past it every day. And also because it was during lockdown um, and during COVID, so more people were going out for walks locally, discovering their local area. Um, so we've had a, a hugely positive um, kind of reception since we've been opening as a visitor um, facility. But also in terms of volunteering, um, I think what's been great is the project's been able to offer a really wide range of volunteering experiences for people um, that has meant that lots of different types of people have been able to engage um, everything from we've got our um, Lock Island adoption group called the Green Team who volunteer religiously every week on a Wednesday and have done an incredible job in helping with the renovation of the island and keeping it looking really beautiful right through to people who um, are involved in the citizen science, which is very much a seasonal offer. Um, so people counting shad, there's um, there's a, another smaller weir in Cheeksbury downstream from Worcester, which has got a notch in it where the shad pass through. 
Um, and that's also where, when Charles was talking in the documentary about the tagging, that's where that takes place. Um, but you can actually see the shad going through that notch. So people stand at the side of the river um, and, and count how many they see in a set period. And that's what helps us to estimate the run. So to how many have come through in total. Um, and then just to one-off experiences. Um, so at the moment, once a week, we have to drain down the pass at Diglis and um, clean the window. <laughs> <laughs> because it gets really dirty. The uh, the Severn is a very uh, silty river and there's quite a lot of algae. Um, and um, we've got this huge window, which is two and a half metres square. And then behind that, there's an LED light panel, which is submerged in the water. Um, and that is what helps us both with the visitor experience in terms of seeing the fish, but also crucially with the monitoring, uh, with the cameras that Jenny talked about that are filming everything that swims past. And because it's emitting light, it attracts algae all the time. So we have to uh, get in there. So we thought, oh, this might be, it might be a bit too out there, but we'll put it out and see if, if people would like to volunteer. And we were inundated <laughs> with people. We booked this, with, this started in, uh, so end of March, beginning of April, we're booked up until August with people wow. coming in wanting this kind of unique view. And, and as Jenny said, you know, you get to go down into the pass and really appreciate how enormous the structure is. Um, potentially see some fish. Sometimes we get some fish caught in the little pools in there that need to be rescued. And so they can get you know, a real close up uh, view of some of the fish. And then, yeah, they get the rubber gloves on. Get the get the sponges out and clean it all for us, and they they love it. People have a great time, and that's just a one-off thing. So for people who haven't necessarily got a huge amount of time, so I think just having that breadth of opportunities has been brilliant, and has allowed lots of people to feel a sense of ownership over the project. Um, yeah, there's there's so many more I could I could go on. Our Diglis Island guides who do all the tours are amazing. You know, we're, we're just so we've been really just incredibly lucky with all the people we've worked with. It's um, always fascinating the things that you wouldn't expect, but people really are very keen to volunteer to do. Um, and it's so valuable because so many things that just wouldn't happen if you didn't have these incredible people that give up the time. So that's just we, so, so incredible to hear. Sorry, we Jane. actually rely on our volunteers to um, welcome visitors to come and see the island and see the fish pass. So just, you know, that in itself is, is critical because we have volunteer tour guides. Absolutely, we, we couldn't do it without them. We've, we have had uh, just over 3,000 visitors to, to the island and the fish pass and that would not have been possible without volunteers. We just, we simply don't have the staff to, to facilitate that. So yeah, we, we are indebted to them, absolutely. Yeah. It also means that we you know can offer it free. So it's, um, it's great. Yeah, that's Incredibly really important. Ah, uh, folks, um, we've been sat here chatting for almost 20 minutes. Um, thank you so much for coming to have a chat with us and thank you for sharing this documentary as part of the Festival of Nature. What's what's next for the Unlocking the Severn project? What's, what's on the horizon? Good question. Um, we've, we've still got some exciting events coming up um, in the summer. We've just just restarted our Diglis Island tours. So we paused those for May during the peak um, uh, fish migration season. So we just had the uh, the fish pass open, but we've just started our tours. So if anybody is in the local area and would like to come and see um, the island and the fish pass, you can book that through the Unlocking the Seven website. We're gonna be running those tours right through up until the start of the summer holidays. Um, at the moment, we're working on what's gonna happen in the summer. Um, some other different um, special events and exciting things. Um, and then moving into the future, it's establishing Diglis in particular as a, as a visitor attraction within Canal and River Trust. So when the external funding comes to an end, um, that'll be run by Canal and River Trust. Um, and making sure that we can sustain all the fantastic volunteering, citizen science opportunities and the scientific monitoring. Um, that's a really important legacy of the project, um, as Jenny talked about earlier to monitor the populations of all of those migratory fish um, and, and to see what happens and, and hopefully to see you know that that rise in in population after a few successful um, spawning seasons. 
And just to add to that, in terms of the fish, because I know you have a sort of focus of activity in the Bath and Bristol area. So it is very topical right now because the fish will be coming out of the river, heading back into the estuary and then out into the Bristol Channel. So if you're in that region, I want you to feel that this is relevant to you too. If you're looking out on the Severn Estuary or the Bristol Channel, you know, that's where the Twait Shad are headed and then they'll they'll be out at sea. Um, until next next spring coming where they head back in to spawn again so I need to turn the sculptures around you can see behind me is one of our uh, we had some some fantastic steel shad sculptures made and they're absolutely massive they're on display on the roof of the building next next to the river seven in Worcester at the moment but I've just realized they're pointing upstream because the whole point is that we've unlocked the river but they're not going upstream anymore <laughs> they're going down I'm gonna have to get up there get up there at different times around. a year <laughs> uh thank you so much folks for coming to chat with us tonight um it's been a pleasure to get to watch this documentary and to chat with you both to hear more about this project i am um, i'm going to use the power that i have to make it just my ugly face on the screen so apologies to everyone at home but thank you jenny thank you lorna and um, if, um, if anyone wants to find out any more about the project the best place to go is unlocking the seven.co.uk it's all on the website fabulous thank you so much thanks for having us and thank you folks that have been watching at home or if you watch it back later hello to you too um we have still got loads of events that are coming up as part of the festival of nature which is running until saturday this week um whether that is in-person events or online events i'll be back tomorrow i'm going to be uh speaking to the people at wild place in bristol i'm going to be meeting some ringtail lemurs which is going to be great fun um i'll be in an office but they'll be in the zoo it'll be it'll be great fun um and then we've got uh, some uh, online comedy happening as well. We've got workshops throughout the week. We've got live streams, uh, discussions. We've got webinars, lots and lots of things that are going on. Thank you so much for watching. Have a lovely rest of your evening. And we'll see you at another event for the Festival of Nature 2022 very, very shortly.